Hello, known world. We have a special uh, presentation on the Coach's Corner today. We're going to be talking about the battle scenarios uh, for this Penzik. I know a lot of you have been eagerly waiting for this, as we do every May, wondering exactly when we're going to plan our vacation and what weapons we're going to bring and what exciting new battles are going to be there. Um, and every year we have a slightly different format with some surprises. Um, uh, but before we get to that, uh, let's meet our panel. Um, we'll go with the usual suspects first. So let's start with Tristan. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be here. Looking forward to this. We're excited to bring out this information pretty much first. I think, uh, <laughs> we were actually worried that some of this info about the battles was not actually official enough to be released tonight. So, uh, we're lucky enough to bring this to you first. And then we've got Bess. Hi, everyone. I'm Sir Elizabeth. Happy to be here tonight. Excited to be talking to the warlords of the East and the Mid. So we'll be getting some really in awesome information. And I think there'll be a couple of new points that they'll be rolling out for this year's Penzik. So stay tuned to learn cool stuff. And then another usual suspect, uh, Sir Pelinor. Hey, everybody. I'm Sir Pelinor. I am the warlord or army general for the Mid Realm. And I'm excited to be to start talking to everybody about what's going to happen at Pensick. And then last but not least, special guest. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Sir Ryu, uh, Ryu Virgin of Iron Skies, Warlord of the East Kingdom. Cheers. Awesome. So uh, let's get into it. Um, we got, is this up and running on the uh, the Facebook page and everything? We confirm that. Oh, it looks like we have a, a, at least one out there. All right, awesome. So uh, I guess I'll give like a quick, I mean, I should probably make everybody wait the full 90 minutes where they actually know what's happening, but uh, give a quick, uh, very super quick synopsis. Um, battles as usual start on Sunday um, and they're gonna be going through Friday. Um, and we're gonna have our usual battles we have uh, for heavy um, with our field uh, bridge and woods battle and then we always have like a special uh, uh different battle on that fourth fighting day not necessarily fourth uh you know in terms of the, the hierarchy there but it's it's uh one of the four battles um and we got some interesting rapier battles um and then we have some uh other uh stuff we're going to talk about here with us um oh we have like we have some archery battles um oh ans competition uh things like that so uh, let's start off with Sunday, which uh, for those people that may not know, Sunday is typically a, uh, I think we call it like the champions battle day. And what that means is um, normally not everyone gets to fight on Sunday. Um, Sunday, typically we have lots of special battles that will feature, for example, uh, might feature the Knights, might feature um, some of the best unbelts from the principal kingdoms. Um, we have some uh, rapiers. So a lot of times for these battles, you have to sort of uh, get invited to these battles. Um, so it's a little bit smaller, but it's also a really good day to sort of be a spectator uh, if you're not fighting any of the battles. Or if you are fighting the battles, um, it's a good chance to uh, maybe get your battle out of the way and then you kind of like get to watch some other people. So I think there's some exciting stuff there. Um, so why don't we start off with um, what is the first battle on Sunday? Looks like it is the Allied Champs battle. <laughs> And I was going to throw this at Ryu and Pelinor, but uh, Ryu actually suggested earlier that uh, for my years as a mercenary, uh, not aligned with uh, the kingdom I lived in, I actually got to fight in the Allied Champs battle a lot. Um, so uh, I'll actually talk about this one, uh, and then we'll move on to the other battles. Um, oh, and this is on my sheet that didn't uh, make it out of the printer. Um, so I don't actually have that. Does somebody have it uh, printed up there? Ah, there we go. There's a scenario. Uh, I'm going to talk about this for a bit, and if 
uh, maybe if somebody can sort of pull up the actual um, uh, document that describes the rules in a minute. Uh, so this is a, our battlefield. So typically what the Allied Champs is, is that the East and Mid-Realm do not participate in this. This is a participation for armored heavy fighting for all of the other allies that are not the East, uh, not the Mid-Realm. I know a lot of times there's some, some negotiating and jockeying for that. And actually, uh, real quickly, um, Ryu, could you talk a little bit about how someone gets onto one of these teams since it wouldn't be any of the Easterners? I mean, so the the name kind of says it all there, right? Uh, it, it's it's allied champions. So you you have uh, any number of kingdoms that can declare for either side, for either of the principal kingdoms, for the East or the Middle. Uh, and then usually amongst them, you know, the whoever brings majority to the war usually ends up taking some degree of captaincy over either side. Uh, and then you establish the total number of players that you have. Sometimes you you guarantee those slots as part of uh, when you you're you're kind of courting allies uh, to see you're going to either side. You promise them slots or positions uh, within this particular battle. Uh, it's pretty fast paced. Uh, if you're if you if you like watching uh, you know sports like rugby, then this is definitely the type of battle for you. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's about all I could talk about with regard to this battle. I've only fought in two of them ever myself. Um, and those were on purple years. So yeah. how do the allies choose how many, like, so there's a bunch of allies, right? There's Eldamir and there's a bunch of other kingdoms. So how do you determine, say, how many Eldamir gets, Trimeris gets, Atlantia gets, how is that determined? Well, so, so there's definitely the part where you could have like, uh, a number, a certain number of slots could be reserved. You know, you can make that deal the the you know sovereigns of each side, or you know anyone who is competing uh, for for slots could definitely make those agreements. But generally, with a hundred people fielding per uh, side, um, I kind of encourage all allies to show up um, because even with the the soccer rotations that you know you could fight as long as you do, and then hopefully get in with as long as that battle is, especially on a hot day, you're going to want somebody that you could tag out with. And how is command of the battle determined? <laughs> sorry, sorry. So you've got your two allied teams out there, 100 on each side. Is there an overall commander of the battle or does it each each kingdom or group of people, because it could be households, do they, are they just assigned, hey, go do this or is it mostly go get him? <laughs> I mean, I, I I think that this is one of those uh, those battles where the uh, the strategy of uh, ride till we find him and kill them all sort of applies. Uh, <laughs> with with the 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 cap flag being the uh the objective uh for for how you win uh the the battle itself in my experience you know again uh, i've only done these for for purple wars you usually have the the people meet uh the day or so before and then you determine what your your overall tactic for that battle is going to be uh, i assume our allies kind of play it play it similarly i don't know barry you've been on that side of that yeah i was going to say uh, typically what happens is i think you'll end up with some principal allies meaning the, the whoever brings the most people so uh, every year it's, it's going to be different depending uh i think one year Eldemir Eldemir was one of the uh the bigger forces on the side that i was on um you know a lot of years atlantia will sort of take the lead on that because atlantia is usually one of the bigger ones um and even then you have you know with the different um you know people for example uh the two chucks usually bring at least a number of people and there's going to be some sort of relationship that you know, the warlord of Atlantia and the two jacks will have, and they'll usually decide, usually just, usually it comes down to divvying out units. You've got the right, this has the left, somebody's got to cover the middle, and then you make some adjustments in the middle of it. Um, there's not much more to it. The, the allies generally have a lot of experience with this. Um, you know, so every year it's just, it's, it's little, um, uh, little variations on strategy that you sort of adjust. But as someone said, it's like, yeah, just line them up and go get them. This, um, this is one of the only battles, honestly, uh, that uh, historically we we allow the allies to kind of negotiate themselves uh, because yeah. we we don't partake in it. We don't compete in it uh, as as the east and the middle directly. So, you know, like with most of these scenarios and most of these battles, we, we go to the communities that actually perform them and ask them, hey, what do you want to do? <laughs> what, what would be fun for you? Uh, so they come back at us, whatever conventions that they like, uh, which is the, the pretty standard one is 100 per side and the map that that you'll see pull out with the uh, with the rotations being allowed, uh, you know, or, or disallowed, you know, the soccer rotations. Yeah. And I, I guess the, the key piece right here that anyone who's an ally might be interested in, uh, I'm reading through the, the rules right here. 
Um, how are the substitutes working? Is it is it one and done, or do you have a pool of substitutes that you can sort of come in and go out? Has anybody read through this yet? If I remember correctly, uh, you have anybody on the field can, when they die, they can come out or they go to the resurrection area and then they resurrect periodically, not immediately. And then if somebody comes off the field, not to the resurrection point, then at the next um, uh, letting out of uh, of the dead people, that's when the, the new um, the new people can come in. Yeah, they call them soccer substitutions. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, so, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, real, so real quick, so you got 100 on a side. And so if I'm fighting and I get killed, I go back to the box. And usually the box gets let out every three minutes. So I'm part of that 100. Now, if at some point I'm like, I'm tired, I want to let someone else in, I step out and that person comes in, but they're going to still be in my spots. So if I'm in the box, then they're in the box until that horn is let out or until a flag is captured and they reset. Um, so I don't want to talk too long about that because we got a lot of battles to cover, but that's that's it in a nutshell. Um, like I said, I know that the variations from year to year are some years it's no substitutes, some years there's a you know 100 fighters and then 15 substitutes, some years it's less fighters, some years it's you can substitute. Once you substitute, you're done for the day. You know, we've done that before. Um, so let's move on to the next battle here. We have uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. unbelted champs. Um, uh, Pelinor, you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, unbuilded champs, we have uh, 30 champions from each side. Um, they, the one pass, line up, uh, lay on, and last combatant standing. Uh, crowns may not fight. Unbelted royal peers by their own hand may not fight. Unbelted heirs may fight. No allies. Uh, just... Whoever's got the better, it usually ends up who's got the better strategy or uh, who who commits their their reserves uh, the the best or or last, um, and we'll see how it comes out. It's uh, interesting how how uh, the different sides line up to me or or uh, engage their troops. Um, sometimes it's one long line. Sometimes uh, the 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 commander might. Do groups of three or five. Um, it, it's it's quite interesting to watch to see how how the the lineups match up and come out. Pell, yeah, was, um, the Eastern or the Mid Realm rather, Commander, do you ever adjust the way your unbelts are lined up or organizing themselves in relation to what the East has done, or do you have a plan? Hey, it's going to be you know you group of six, you know you five groups of six, or do you change it on the fly? Um, I think usually there's a there's a plan ahead of time. Uh, depending on the plan, it might they might have an alternate plan in case they see something. Uh, but that's up to the up to the commander of, of the uh, the unbelts. Um, I've seen both happen, but generally it, they're not going to change something right on the fly, right at the last second. Um, that brings up a lot of un uncertainty. Uh, people just get confused, and you can. You can just ruin a, a battle right then just from that. Yeah, it's funny. I was going to say, um, well, with that, over the years, um, I used to have pretty strong opinions about how those battles were fought. And I've evolved those opinions over the years because I used to fight with a pretty close-knit mercenary household. And then realizing that some of the strategies for unbelted battles are that you bring in all these people from all over the kingdom. Typically, I know that some years, I've, I've seen some years where there have been like a lot of VDK fighters for the East, or there have been a lot of um, Blood Guard fighters for the East. I've seen some years where a lot of Dark Moon fighters for the Mid. But I think a lot of times you're bringing these people together. And so the amount of training you can do is going to be different than you can for, say, a household. So imagine if Dark Moon put together a unit for anything of 20 people. You know, you're going to have a lot of knowing how each other fights, and that's going to be a little bit different. Um, I will say, as someone who recently got knighted, um, so I'd been on, you know, uh, the radar for the Unbelt team on and off for several years. Um, it's actually kind of how Ryu and I first met was on an Unbelt team um, True. many years ago. Um, yeah, I think you were, uh, no, I think you were the commander the following year, but that, yeah, that year it was uh, Harold. Um, but we were in the same unit. Yeah, we were two of the Poles in the same 10-man uh, team. Um but yeah, it's it's a pretty big deal in the East Kingdom, especially if you're a melee fighter, and it's kind of like a, a good goal to get onto that team 
and it's a good sort of showcase of abilities. And, you know, we take a lot of pride in that hopefully people get on that team several years in a row and then eventually they're not allowed to be on the team anymore because they have the wrong color belt. <laughs> yeah, they- Barry had just said that it's a it's a big deal to be on the, the Eastern Unbelted team. How do you choose your Unbelteds? Yeah, so so I, I, I'm going to touch base on also like, so personal, personal experience, personal opinion. Uh, the Unbelted Champions is the show to me. It's my my favorite uh, individual like 30 seconds of Penzik War. Uh, it's, it's a run program, you know, type thing. And if you blink, you'll miss it. Um, the, the way that we, we typically, uh, pick for, uh, the, the champions is that we have people that, uh, so we'll have a captain. Uh, I've been captain myself in the past and my captain will appoint, uh, kind of like regional deputies and then they'll have meetings to kind of talk about, Hey, who's looking good. Who's not looking good. Uh, one of the things that's very unique about, you know, this particular battle, it's a 30 man squad, right? Um, or 30 man team made up of, you know, probably five squads or six squads, depending on how they want to do their, their breakup. Uh, And those will be people that all kind of work tight knit together. Um, One of the things that has to be considered about this particular battle is that you're not picking uh, people for individual prowess. You're picking them for how they complement one another. Right. So like you're, you're looking at, at a a group of three to six that you're stacking to be like, okay, well, they're, this person is, is good on their own, but like they're, you could, select someone over them based on on how well they partner situational awareness um you know to kind of like stack your your deck to work together you know it's uh it's a it's a really a really interesting uh battle because you you don't really have a lot of room for error um and you know the the uh strategy that you can employ is really um to to expect that the first thing that you do is is going to start to disintegrate and you're going to have to fall to a contingency you know inside of 10 seconds <laughs> Um, I, w- I would add that if you are want to, if you do want to try uh, getting onto the unbelt team, whether it's the the east or the mid, take uh, take people with you to the to the practices because we do practices throughout the summer. Also, uh, take other people that you fight with a lot. Take them with you. All of you go to the practice. Um, more th- you're more than likely if you can show that you're working as a team, you're more likely to get get on the team. Yeah, for sure, for sure, absolutely. Awesome. Um, and let's see, we got a lot of battles to cover here. So after that, we have the Unbelt Alternates and Allies uh, uh, battle. Um, and uh, I am uh, I got to fight on the Alternates battle last year. Um, I had an injury I was coming off of, and I was hoping to make the main team. I thought I was ready, but it's, it takes a little bit of time to convince the commanders that you're ready. So, um but uh, we had a lot of fun with that. So that's kind of like we're hoping, you know, the people for that team, you're hoping that the following year that they're going to make it up to the uh, the main team. Um, and I also like this. It, it seems like it gives a little bit of flexibility to, you know, allow a couple more people maybe to get on the team that, that really, you know, you just didn't have room for otherwise. Um, and then it looks like uh, that you can grab some allies for this, too. Does somebody want to talk about how that happens? I mean, I could, I could talk about that too. Um, so, right. so the uh, the the you know the the unbelted champions, you know, it's thir- thirty individual fighters. You know, when you get to those those last like five fighters or so, um, they honestly any given Sunday could could end up have been an alternate for for the team, right? Like any anyone else could have been within striking distance of any given day. Um, so usually when you look at a team, yeah, you field 30, but you probably have about 45 that actually make the team, um, you know, between 45 and 50 that are, are quote on the team, but th- they would be like the, the, your bench instead of your starter, you know, they're, they're both, if you're, if you could put it in sport terms, they're all varsity, but you know, they're not necessarily the starter. Right. Um, and so a few years ago we started having, you know, these people that all kind of cut their teeth throughout the season, having them fight against each other. And, you know, a, a lot of the non-principal kingdoms, they, they bring a lot of hot uh, sticks to, to war two that are, you know, unbelts, but they don't get to fight in, in their version of like an unbelted champions. So we, we all kind of became friends with our contemporaries at that time. And then I believe it was either uh, Sir Sterling or Sir Trentis uh, that started, or maybe both of them uh, that said, hey, why don't we have the the alternates fight, uh, you know, just not have it count just for funsies. And then we've carried it on as a tradition since. So we'll have, you know, two Chucks and fighters from Eldermere and Ethelmark and Atlantia all 
within this battle. And it's just kind of an exhibition uh, for what the the level uh, that you would be expected to bring to an unbelted champions battle. Yeah. Hey, one thing I want to add to that, that, that that's nice for that battle is that so typically so the mid's going to bring 30 unbelts and the east is going to bring 30 unbelts for the main battle. But you can't guarantee that somebody's not going to have an armor failure that morning or get sick or or miss a plane or whatever. And so you have to have um, reserves. You have to have backup fighters. And they kind of have to be there in armor ready to go. And as much as we like to say, hey, just the fact that you are there ready to go should should be enough satisfaction for you. And let's be honest, it's not. We all want to fight. And that's where the alternates battle is sort of nice is it allows people to be able to come up there and show up in their armor. And if a slot opens up, they might be on the main team. And if it doesn't open up, they know that they're still going to get the fight. They didn't sort of put their armor on just to kind of, you know, hope that, well, I hate to say this, hope that at the last minute somebody breaks a leg. <laughs> I mean, we, we've had, we've had morning of submissions uh, or like substitutions, right? We've yeah. had morning of like where somebody has like come in and they've, they've literally, uh, had either like a gear failure or they didn't show up or, uh, you know, something like, like a car broke down, like they're supposed to come in on Saturday. Right. Yeah. So like we, we have this substitution for this person that we think is supposed to be there. We're like, are we ready to go? And they're like, well, I didn't come to walk through. And they're like, what happened? It's like, well, their car caught fire on the way. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. that actually happened. So then we have to have these, these substitutions, you know, for that person. We're like, oh, I'm, I'm glad we talked about that. And that the person is here in gear already. You know? Yeah. Nice. I think we've um, so had we got, we've had people we got, that uh, oh god we've had people that have family emergencies and they just have to leave Pensick. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know last Pensick for and we're going to talk about the belted champs, but we had uh, unfortunately a very important person end up getting COVID the night before. Um. Yep. So um, let's see, Ryu. Uh, well, who's up now? Who just spoke about the alternates? I guess it's uh, Pelinor's turn. Uh, you want to talk about the uh, the belted champs? Sure. Uh, this year, we're, it'll be 20 on 20. Uh, one pass again, last combat standing, just like usual. No crowns, may fight, heirs may, no allies. Um, here again, uh, you're, you're bringing together, uh, trying to bring together your, your best uh, uh, melee knights. Um, a lot of times, you're also mixing in there uh, a lot of good, really good uh, single spiders. Um, and your commander is is combining them as best he can. Uh, belted champs is just an older version of unbelted champs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> you just it's the same thing except you're taking people that no one wants to see anymore. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, they are they're all fun. They're all fun. It, it's sort of uh, I used to. You know, as a mercenary, I used to just not even walk. Well, as a mercenary who lives deep in the bog, I, I wouldn't be anywhere near the battlefield on Sunday. Um, I started, once I started making a lot more friends within the kingdom, I would sort of show up. I remember years ago, like I showed up and, you know, just to watch, um, you know, how the battles would play out. Um, so that was the belted. Um, and then we have uh, rapier melee champs. Um, so, uh, Rai, you want to tell us about the rapier melee champs? Yeah, sure. Uh, rapier melee is, is usually th uh, done in three heats. Um, so we have like a standard. So because for for many, many years, the uh, rapier community did not have a way to really separate between belt and unbelt, uh, we're still doing things that are, are you know, in an older convention um, where we, you know, aren't really, you know, determining things by like mods, non mods when we're when we're building our teams out. Um, but we have, you know, 15 v, v 15 for our principles, then, uh, 15 V 15 for our allied, and then a 30 V 30, where we combine the two of them together, uh, in order to separate it into three heats. Um, they go pretty fast, uh, overall, but the, the, uh, premise is kind of the same, you know, you're, you're trying to build these, uh, smaller squads where you're trying to get, you know, your temporary numerical supremacy until you have like the last person standing, um, it's, uh, it's, I think we do them normally uh, two out of three. If we were doing that, it was like a war point year or two out of three wins the, the, the heat overall. You know, we're not doing war points this year. I see some of the, uh, the things that we, we have still list uh, points, but, you know, still the victory condition uh, is still last person standing, three heats, uh, 15 v 15, 15 v 15, uh, 30 v 30. And it's another situation where like the, 
the Allied Kingdoms, their slots are, are generally things that are discussed uh, within the people who are, you know, running the war, uh, the, the, the kings and queens respectively, or the sovereigns and consorts respectively. Uh, and then, you know, you, you combine, you know, who you have, you put them forth, you're like, I have, you know, five, or I have three, I have, you know, seven that I could put forth that are, are melee specialists for this particular field. Okay, and then I'm assuming the alternates is probably a similar deal to the uh, to the alternates for the uh, the unbelted uh, armored fighting. Yeah, same premise. Okay, okay. And how long has uh, how long has this battle been going? Because I I can remember a time I know rapier's really been growing, but I can remember a time when rapier was like something you heard existed and you walk past and there might be 10 people doing it. I mean, this, this goes back a long time ago, but it's, it's really exploded in uh, the, the last decade or so. Um, how long have these battles been going on? The, uh, the, the, the Sunday uh, champions battles. Uh, I, uh, I actually don't know when they started because they've been uh, prevalent as long as I've, I've been involved in uh, the overall uh, structure for the war. So like you said, within the past decade, uh, they've they've been present and they've been growing both uh, in their their relevance as well as you know how much uh, attention that we give to these particular events. Um, and I think you know the to some degree we could thank the fact that there's there's a track for for the rapier community, but there's also like a showcase and we we have a number of uh, royals that you know actively partake in that sport. You know, like uh, uh, Queen Keelan is is uh, a a grant level. Uh, fencer here in the east you know so like we have advocacy in in that forum uh yeah. for the entire community yeah and our, our crown prince is a uh is a mod yep that's true our crown yeah. prince is master defense yep um heroic champions heroic champions is something that uh <laughs> i saw it best just said she loves that yeah heroic champions i'll be honest something that if you asked me five years ago it was probably maybe 10 years ago it was the least I could have been interested in. And then I actually stumbled upon it one day, sat around and watched. And I think because I'm a little extroverted, I was like, oh, I just, the match, I knew so many people that were fighting in all these interesting matchups. And I remember, you know, at the time, uh, you know, both, uh, I remember Arn, um, who was now Sir Arn, and, uh, and it was uh, Hugo, who was now Sir Hugo, uh, many years ago, were the sort of the hot shot on belts from uh, the East and, and Atlanta, and loved watching those fights. Uh, as long as just all sorts of other interesting matchups, you know, the the hot pole arm from this kingdom versus the hot pole from that kingdom, or I think one was it was the the old knight from Atlanta versus the old knight from the East was was a fun fight. Um, so, uh, Pelinar, you want to tell us a little bit about how Hurrah Champs uh, is run and how that comes, you know, any interesting uh, information about it? Sure. Uh, Heroic Champs, um, I believe they uh, uh, they pick, each side will have their, their group of, of Heroics, and uh, one will pick first, and then the other side will pick a, a matching champion that they want to match up with. And then I, I believe it switches every other time. Uh, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, Ryu. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, for, for Armored Heroics and Rapier Heroics, they do them a little bit differently. Uh, the Rapier Heroics, uh, they discuss in advance, you know, to see what would put together the most interesting fight. The Heavy Weapons has another level of uh, kind of like a dynamic to it in which there's kind of like a call and effect in which someone puts out a name, you know, as like a challenge and then the uh the other side is has a responsibility to respond to them um so there's an element of of strategy uh to who you're playing for like a call and effect there as well based on the heroes that you have within your stable you know and uh we have 15 you know armored uh which we you know the the goal is to always have some degree of kind of like parity between uh, the side. So if you had someone who is a royal peer, you try to always put them against a royal peer. You have someone who is like a seated royal, you, you try to put them against someone who's a seated royal. So that way you maintain stations equally, including, you know, our, our unbelts. There are a number of featured unbelts. Um, that you're but yeah, it's, it's a call and effect. Uh, we affectionately refer to this as our Pokemon battle. <laughs> yeah. If you get the top reference. <laughs> uh, one thing I like that they do is um, that at, at one point in time, they would have all of the armored heroics go and then all of the rapier um what they've been doing what they're going to do this year and have been uh, last year for sure is doing an armored then a rapier and going back and forth um so that 
so that everybody is can see all of the the heroics going on. Um, oh, oh yeah, for sure. When we when we we alternate back and forth between the the armored and rapier that just started a few years ago, um, and uh, it's actually super beneficial to the people who are running it as well. Uh, but it, it uh, it's great to see uh, the com the communities kind of showcase each other, especially if you're you're not actively <laughs> involved in rapier and you could actually see what what the top end of that looks like. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's actually one of the things that got me more involved in Rapier was being able to see the performance level of, of people who were were coming out and fighting for each respective kingdom. Yeah, this whole uh, heroic champs reminds me a little bit of like championship boxing or mixed martial arts where where there's so much in the presentation. When I say the presentation, I don't mean like pomp and circumstance and all that kind of stuff, but I mean more like, oh, uh, you know, we're calling out, you know, so-and-so and then like, like, it sounds like you guys do the best you can to match someone that's going to be a good fight rather than come up with a strategy where, like, hey, every time they throw one of their best fighters, let's throw our worst fighter at them so that we can save, like, our, our good fighters for other fights or something like that. And, and you know, so I, I find that to be very exciting when you guys do that. Yeah, I mean, also, when you have kingdoms as large as the East and the Middle and the, the Honestly, and all of our ally kingdoms, you know, when, when you have a kingdom that's coming from, you know, the West or you you have, you know, Antir or uh, Anstiora or any of these places, they're traveling thousands and thousands of miles. The people who show up to Penzik tend to be the travel team. So we don't we don't really have bad fighters to throw away. So it's all about making the interesting fight uh, that's going to be the most fun to watch. Um, that, that are the things that we're going to then look at those videos for years and years and years and be like, how did he pull that off? You know? Right. That that Ron Valder shot that you see coming in at like 100 frames per second to see how he did that. <laughs> yeah. Um. That so that was on Monday. Uh, I'm sorry, that was Sunday. So that's what goes on Sunday. So for anyone listening, this is the um, so Sunday usually kicks off all the war points. Um, I will throw in real quickly. Um, there are usually there's a little bit of uh, Saturday unofficial activities. Um, there's like some warm up battles. There's one. Typically one behind the castle that's sort of a melee battle that's unlimited resurrection, no points, no champions, no nothing. If one side's too strong, they ask 10 people to switch sides. And then oftentimes Duke Timothy will have his pickup uh, adult swim battles out there, uh, adult swim practice. Um, so, yeah, there definitely is stuff that goes on on Saturday. And I believe sometimes there's pickups during Peace Week as well. Uh, let's move on to Monday. Um, and it looks like uh, I haven't seen this. And I don't know if I've ever seen this, but we're starting off with the bridge battle um, for uh, armored combat. And actually, I think for all these battles, all these days, I believe we start off with heavy um, and then we go to rapier um, uh, after the heavy. And I, I believe my understanding is that that has a lot to do with uh, it's easier to fight in in, uh, in uh, rapier clothing in the heat than it is in armor. Is that is that correct? <laughs> is that what drives that? So I, I've heard a lot of re, uh, reasons and rationale for why we do rapier later in the day. Um, one is that it is the preference of that community. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier because of the, the gear that they're wearing, but it's definitely easier to if you do both. Mm -hmm. If you are if you are both an armored combatant uh, and a rapier combatant uh, and you're fighting in 60 pounds of gear and then you drop down to uh, just cloth afterwards, you're like, this is doable. Having done it the other way around for the years that we did it the other way, it is absolutely miserable. <laughs> All right. Well, Ryan, yeah. while you're on, you want to talk about the bridge battle? I, I noticed that we're doing a little bit different uh, format this year for the bridge. Uh, yeah, we could talk about that for a little bit. I mean, why not? Uh, so we're we're doing five bridges um, of uh, varying widths. It's 18, 18, 27, 18, 18. Uh, there'll be a space between each one of them. It's 54 feet. You know, you could read these stats. Um, I'm not going to read each one of them because you'll you'll you have them in front of you. I'm sure. Uh, the one thing that's really interesting about this particular year um, is we couldn't decide whether or not it was more fun uh, for us to have a non-resurrection battle or a resurrection battle. Um, and so what we settled on was having resurrections uh, for the first 10 minutes of the battle, but not the last five minutes. So if it's a a 15 minute battle, which it it can go up to 15 minutes. Um, it it's 10 minutes resurrection. Eventually, the resurrections will stop at 10 minutes. You know, there will be uh, an announcement that that is is happening. Clearly announced. You know that that it is occurring. Um, and then for the remainder of those five minutes, uh, all deaths are you know final. 
you know, so if you're thrown off the bridge or or you're killed, you know, you you you're out of the battle for that particular round. And again, there there are five total rounds, five total bridges. Uh, and then if there's uh, anything that's contested, um, you you fight for that that last flag for the cap uh, in the middle. Um, and there are no breakouts. Wait, Sorry, no, say there are no breakouts on the bridges. Well, there'll, there'll be no breakouts uh, if it's contested. Oh, oh, it's contested. oh. <laughs> that's that's if it's contested. Uh, okay. Uh, so if you if you in those five minutes manage to to blow through uh, enemy forces and you you go for that breakout, like more power to you. Uh, if you if you're still contesting for the bridge in that time, um, then you know obviously we don't want someone to win their bridge then run to another one well that one is also contested if it's also contested ah uh, okay uh, so that's there is kind of a a, a contingency uh so, we'll have combat archery and uh, siege in in one two and three so i just want to go back to that new little little to me at least it's new so you're on a contested bridge it's the last bit you win your bridge don't leave because you're yeah. not going to be allowed. So just stay on the bridge. You've won. Right. Nobody else is going to come. Just retain possession. Set, set, set up set up camp. You own that bridge. Okay, guys. Victory conditions are really important. Remember this. Don't leave the bridge. Yeah. 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 It, like, Unless you're fighting red. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. You leave yeah. all the bridges. So, so, and again, that's, 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 basically at the end of the battle so it's if at 15 minutes there are still people remaining on those bridges you know after after the 10 minute resurrection after the five minute non-resurrection if you're still on those bridges you're fighting for control of that bridge at which point you you cannot leave afterwards yeah this is a very interesting dynamic i don't think i've ever seen this before um i've definitely done um resurrection bridge battles and i've done one-off bridge battles and like you said there's there's it's hard to tell which is more enjoyable I know which I prefer. Um, I prefer, and I'll tell you right now, I prefer no resurrection. And the reason why I do that is because I'm a veteran spear fighter. Um, I've got a lot of experience. And so I usually get up there and I have a pretty good time. And I'm also uh, kind of undersized um, for uh, some. Talk to me, Barry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We got good. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably an above average size for this call, but still, I'm not the kind of person. Like, the, these battles, I find the, the meat grinders sort of favor some of the bigger fighters out there that can sort of really push push some people off of bridges and throw people around and really kind of push past the line. Um, but on the other hand, I know some people that, um, you know, like a lot of people, if they go out there and if they don't have resurrections, they might walk up to the front, get stabbed by a spear five times in a row, and that's their day. And that's not fun for them. What, what, um, what I think is a, is fun about having the dynamic of both of them, uh, having you know been seated royalty at Penzik, um, you are the target of everyone who can hit you from thirty to ninety feet away. So, so this gives if you're a high profile target, if you're if you're a commander, uh, if you're a seated royal, uh, it allows you to have a good amount of fun in the battle before you were inevitably sniped. Yeah. <laughs> And how do the resurrections work again? There's a question here about it says resurrections at start line. So so the resurrections are active for the first 10 minutes. So we you know we have our res lines, right? When we're we go to any resurrection battle, there's always a point. Res points. We call, in the mid they're called res points. Is that what yeah, you yeah. yeah, okay. It, it usually it usually when we when we have like the full field style battles, there's there's usually like one very specific line of delineation you must cross, but you're behind that when you're when you're getting uh your resurrections. So for the first 10 minutes, you'll be allowed to walk behind that line to resurrect. After those 10 minutes, uh, the reses will be closed. So if you go to that side of the line, you're just dead. Like there's no, there's no coming back. The uh, the, the 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 portal to the netherworld is gone. <laughs> um, so the there are banners uh, that will indicate uh, when the reses are active, and they'll be dropped at 10 minutes to indicate that they're no longer active. So if you if you look behind you and you see that that flag is down. You're like, okay, well, now I know that if I die, I'm dead. And will you have marshals making sure that people, because it's new this year, hey, no reses, the, you're at the 10-minute mark? Oh, yeah, mo mo most assuredly, there will be line marshals for the resurrection because we have to have someone who drops those banners, right? So right. so the people who drop those banners will indicate, you know, that it's, it's over and, like, let people know, I'm sure. Sounds good. Okay, good. Um, I will say that uh, from having fought bridge battles since 1994, um, they have gone from what was probably the worst battle at Penzik 
um, to a very fun battle um, back in the 90s for who Oliver Ouch was there. Uh, some of those bridge battles would take hours, and it was one battle, one death. Yeah. You know, and uh, and sometimes people want to win so badly, they would just, you know, cap the end of the bridge. Or that was back when the scudums were popular, set up some, some scudums and, you know, really, really, like, lock down a bridge and uh yeah i really like the the time limits and the, having the multiple battles and multiple scenarios and stuff like that has really made this interesting um and then if we can go on to the uh the Barry, before we go on oh, i go do ahead. have something i'd like to say uh when you were reading the descriptions of the battles you would have seen that there were five bridges they were you know this far apart there are no hay bale ferries Penzik staff sets these up but they also need volunteers from just the populace but if for no other reason then we want battles to start on time if fighters could just come up you know move a couple of hay bales you'd really save a lot of time the next day we're always kicking around wondering why the hell the field isn't set up already and the answer is there's just not enough volunteers so i'd like to encourage everybody every fighter if you could move one hay bale or two hay bales then it, the battles would be on time. They'd be quick and they tend to go, they, they move very quickly. So I do want to encourage everybody there, as I say, no hay bale fairies and ask, you know, the Pensick staff who are on vacation themselves to come in and move all the hay bales all the time is asking a lot of them. So just when you can remember, if you're walking from this side of the field to that and the battles are over, <laughs> drag a hay bale with you because they'll be setting up for the next day. And Pelly wants to say something. Oh, we can't hear you, Pelly. Pelly, you're muted. Ah, there we go. <laughs> uh, usually their battlefield setup is setting up the night before, right after the fencing battles. And a lot of times it's the fencers that are helping set up the battlefield for the armored guys. So uh, if they're setting up for, for uh, fencers right after the armored, help them set up for the art for the Armored guys help set up for the fencers because they're doing the same thing for us. Yep. Okay. We'll have to do that. I don't understand why it's not hay bale fairies. I got like dish fairies and laundry fairies in my house. I need some of them in my house. I leave a bunch of dishes out. And the next thing I know, they're clean the next day. Because you know what will happen, Barry? If we, if we don't move the hay bales, there will be a rose that picks up a hay bale. And then we will all drop everything we are doing immediately. Yes. yes. And we cannot let that happen. <laughs> Do not <laughs> let roses move hay bales. I heard the, uh, was it uh, the year, the last year that uh, Tyndall was king? And he talked about that. He's like, I went and moved to hay bale. I was like, oh, that was really nice. He's like, I've learned the king moves one hay bale and then everything else gets moved. Okay, guys, I just have one quick question. A viewer asked us about the res point. Will it be the same, uh, is the res point the same as the start line? Is it 50 feet back from the bridges or will it be closer because we only have 10 minutes for resing? So you, usually there is the the uh, the start line and then there is a resurrection line. There should be, right. there should be two different lines because your start line is where you're off the field. That's where your, your water bearers and everything can be. They, mm -hmm. they kind of float between the start line and the resurrection line. Um, so I, I would I would say they're probably two separate lines. Okay. Um, and usually, usually is the uh, res fifty feet off from the bridge the end of the bridges. I'm trying to see where do they find fifty feet? It was a question that we were asked. Maybe that's what it's been in the past. Uh, I do know it was one of the Hayville theories that asked us. Uh Oh wait, yeah. So and so engines can can uh, only deploy fifty feet from the end of the bridge. Um, so it'll probably be something similar to that. Uh, okay. I I can't imagine it being much farther than that um, in general. But again, it'll be it'll be clearly marked when we have the field the day of. Um, hey, if I get those something in there, speaking of clearly marked, can we please not use orange spray paint for the colorblind? Oh yeah, it is oh. it is invisible. Uh, alternate suggestions. <laughs> there you go. White, white always works. 
I would don't use green either. I mean, the, the resurrection <laughs> lines are going to be <laughs> marked. With, grass. Okay, got you, Matt. The, the, the resurrection lines are going to be marked with flags, so that that's sort oh, of nice. Helps. Yeah, or some empty bales. Yeah. I can tell you about like seven, eight years ago, I, was, I, I wanted to make my persona. I thought about making myself Barry Green Spear, and I was going to fight with a green spear. And I made a green spear. And I did an Allied Champs battle one year where I brought a spear and a pole arm. I left my spear out in the field and I went and fought my pole arm. And man, it took me forever to find that green spear in that big, giant grass field. So that was the end of Barry Green Spear. Um, so you were going to be Barry Green Spear, and then you made yourself a spear, but your spear wasn't green, so everyone would always ask. <laughs> it's like a little drawn or something. No, the, the packaging said green on it, so I know it was green. The um, Oh, uh, real quick. Um, yeah, let's move on. I, I do want to say this. Uh, we're not going to cover everything, but these documents will be coming out soon. And actually, I think Bess is sort of copying everything into the chat anyway. So anything we'll actually talk about here... You can sort of read in the chat and this stuff will be coming out well, this isn't going to be a secret up until the uh the day of penzik um so uh what do, uh crossroads battle rapier crossroads battle uh palinor you want to take that one there we go sure yeah um do you have the map for that severed so the it's going to be a 60 minute battle uh one of the uh, uh resurrection battle and one of the interesting parts of this is this is the first time at Penzik that we will be using spears. Um, if you can see the green area at the north end of the map, um, that is where the, the spear area will be. Um, anybody operating a spear has to stay, has to keep their feet in that area, uh, but they can, uh, I believe they can spear someone outside of it. Um, this is going to be an area that will be watched by the marshals quite heavily um, because this is the first time we've had spears as far as i know in this big of a battle um, we want to make sure that everyone is safe everybody keeps a cool head um, nothing untoward happens uh, just to make sure that people are being safe in a larger battle if something happens and things go pear-shaped in here then they will not have not have uh, spears in the rest of Pensick. Uh, or if it's just an individual, the um, the uh, uh, their majesties can choose not to allow that person to be using spears for the rest of the rest of Pensick. Um, and other, this, oh, go ahead. Go, uh, other than that, it's uh, uh, capture the flag. Um, We've got uh, buildings in here to hold on to. Uh, we've got areas uh, at the south end that um, uh, to, to fight around. Um, should be pretty fun. All right, and it's a, what? It's a one-hour resurrection battle. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna make one one quick uh, just note on this. So they're not capture the flag. The flags are are used to indicate who's king of the hill. Um, just because capture the flag in terms of like game mechanic is I'm grabbing a thing and bringing it somewhere else. Oh, this yep. is for our set locations. You are are attempting to have uh, field supremacy in those areas and maintain those those specific mark zones. So are you flipping the flag then? Like it's blue on one side, red on the other, and you just flip, or is it just? Eh? It's Barry's pointing to his form. Okay, sorry, Barry. I'm just, I'm just laughing. There, there are four time checks during this at okay. 15, 30, 45, and 60. Okay. Um, I am looking. You got five flip sticks. Yeah, I think I think there it's is. a flip stick. Flips, I think it is a flip sticks. Uh, it just says that that we have the flags to determine those checks. I assume that's going to be based on whatever fizz rip we have for that time. Okay. So, but it'll either be a, a, a flip stick or a pulley based on what we have. Yeah, it okay. says flip sticks in the in the in the initial setup. There it is. It's it's under uh, in the break section. All flip sticks will be reset to neutral. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, also, during this, in the middle of the at thirty minutes or right after the second time check, there will be a short water break. Oh. And again, this year, water is as always. It's our responsibility, right? The water break is for us to go get our water. There will be no 
SCA sponsored water bearers? Correct. Yeah, so definitely bring a backpack full of water if you don't have someone in your household to help uh, take care of that. Um, all right, so that's uh, Monday Rapier Battle. That's all of Monday battles. Uh, Tuesday, classic Tuesday, woods, woods, woods. Um, so I guess I'll say real quick, um, I know for the heavy side, historically, woods battles have been 90 minutes uh, uh, control point battles. So not capture the flag, but but control king of the hill, control the flag. Um, are there any differences this year? Right. You've got uh, some information on this. Yeah, so we're we're going with the with the classic woods, right? So this is a 90 minute battle. There are three flags, three checkpoints, right? So 30, 60, 90, plus or minus two minutes. Um it's uh it's our standard uh, you know, and then we'll determine what sides we're on the going or throwing. If you're a football fan, uh, I think we'll be determined either by a, a coin flip or whoever is down in points. Um I don't remember what we settled on for there. Um, but the the it, it is it is our our standard you know like church woods battle it is three three caps uh three flags you know whoever has majority at the end um will will determine the victor for the for that particular battle okay and we i i got a note here that combat archery is going to be allowed on one of the flags what uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so so one of the one of the zones which will be delineated will allow uh, combat archery if if they so choose um that that same territory when we go to uh rapier later will be the zone that spears will be allowed so that, man that's new yeah so we traditionally don't have combat archery uh in the woods it's not a it's not a thing that typically comes up um but you know we we figured we would allow it uh, to through the the only real reason to not have ca uh in the woods is that you will lose your arrows <laughs> but you know if if you want to come out if you have some set aside for that you know that are in bright colors that aren't orange apparently uh then yeah. you could come out and have a good time wow well, in the woods battle at uh at um golf war the east and the mid were working together and we got the we got the uh combat archery flag for the entire battle so pelinor how about this time you and i will fight each other but not in that area <laughs> that sounds good to me all right we'll, we'll make a deal we'll meet each other on out there what's going on with the rapier uh section of this then pelinor you got this one yeah it's a uh the rapier is a 60 minute resurrection battle and like uh, ryu said there'll be spears in the in the northern section uh flip sticks um other than that it's uh very similar to your traditional woods battle for the rapier also so i'm curious why is the rapier battle shorter than the armored combat battle so there's there's really two reasons for that uh one is the request <laughs> for the people who are doing it uh the second one is is um honestly safety uh and it's it's you know something to think about when when we fight in heavy weapons uh, it is the responsibility of the person who is is competing in that in their in their gear to protect themselves, right? So your armor is protecting you. As battles go on, uh, your technique a lot of times can become worse. Uh, but in heavy weapons, that means that you may not be throwing calibrated blows, right? As opposed to in rapier, when you are competing, uh, you are responsible for the safety of the person that you are attacking. Right. Oh. So as you become exhausted, you become your your inability to throw properly with the technique means you may not pull shots. Right. And if you're not pulling shots, then you could actually pose a threat to the people that you're fighting. Um, Great answer. Thanks. Yep. It hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I don't want to I don't think we need to cover this. It'll be in the guide. But um, there is uh, contingency plans. If for whatever reason it's too wet to fight in the woods or they woods are full of bees or the trees are all you know leaning or there's the tornado yeah <laughs> like, little things or, or any number of things that possibly could cut like the, the woods have been canceled i think twice in the time that i've been going to Pensac. so it can happen let's hope it doesn't yeah Rapier and then on, got rained out last year yep yep and then on the tuesday we also have the throne weapons champions so what is the throne weapons champions right do you know what that is i'm looking for right in front of me um so yeah so thrown weapons um it's it's 
I mean, the, this is the the thing that we put forward. This is what the the thrown weapons community came back with us for what they're what they're looking for. Uh, it's uh, two eight foot tall by four foot wide, uh, with nine target circles of varying sizes, uh, painted to different heights on each. Uh, so we have we have fifteen total champions on each team. That's including the team captain, um, and the uh, the team captains are the first competitors of each team. Uh, throwing distance ten feet uh, for axe or knife, twenty feet for spear. Uh, if you've ever seen anyone throw the javelins, they're they're actually really quite impressive. I tried my hand at it uh, last year. I was terrible. <laughs> they were they were not at all like the ones that I used in uh, in high school, uh, which I was only going for length. Um, but uh, so uh, each competitor uh, will have the same number of weapons on the range. Uh, all competitors obviously uh, must obey the retrieval rules at the range. Uh, that was kind of key because the, the like you can trip and fall over things, and it's not not particularly great. Um, and then uh, after the first competition, sides uh, alternate choosing thrower uh, with the loser of the first competition. Um, so these are head to head; uh, they're two heats each um, with a, with tiebreaker. So if you if you ever seen them, so the, they're set up next to each other. Uh, when they mean they're they're, they're they're we're calling them head to head. They're really side by side. They'll they'll be competing uh, against one another, uh, and teams will will you know have one go go one against another. So. Similar, like kind of like a call and effect. We have like one person you put someone against them, um, and so then the the specific weapons are determined by the heats that they have. It's uh, axes, then daggers, um, and like up to twenty up to twenty throws uh, to hit all nine targets. Um, so the this is you know like what, what that means is you know you have your twenty weapons right your total, uh, and then you know to hit each one of these targets. Obviously, if you don't hit them, you don't score. Um, and then the tiebreaker, it'll go to spear. Cool. Interesting. From what I understand, to uh, choose their teams, uh, they will uh, they'll have tryouts on Sunday after the regular range closes, and then also on Tuesday they'll have a second round. And uh, they do this because a lot of the a lot of the uh, participants are from different kingdoms, so they can have everybody trying out at the same time. Uh, and if if I understand correctly, the uh, tryouts for mid and east are going on at the same time, usually. Yeah, we'll we'll do ours at the same time, and again, you know, because like we talked about earlier, with with all of the uh, the people coming from thousands and thousands of miles away, like you know, they they'll be coming in and and leaving at different times. Um, so they try to they try to make it so that you know we could be kind of as inclusive as possible uh, with the people that can compete in it. Will there be any limit on the ally uh, from the allied kingdoms for any of these champions, the throwing weapons, or I know you'll be talking about archery in a second. Will there be any limits on the on the allied uh, participation in them? I think if there is, it's listed. Um, I I don't think there's anything listed. There I hadn't seen it, so that's why I was curious. It was just like, hey, we're we're going to pick the, you know, the the fifteen best, whatever, regardless of kingdoms or ally ship. I think I believe yeah. that's what they do. That's that's generally what they, they kind of line it up, and it's just performance based. So you you can in fact get bumped by someone who who showed up and just was particularly ace with a shot. So okay. So um, I think we started this tradition maybe six, seven, eight years ago. But uh, from the perspective of heavy and uh, rapier, uh, Wednesday is a day off. It's a day to get your shopping done. Um, it's a day to uh, relax. It's a day to do your armor repairs. Um, but we do have uh, one competition going on Wednesday, and that is the Archery Champions. Uh, Ryan, do you know much about that? All right, I'm pulling it up in front of me. <laughs> I've, got, I've got so many, so many different things uh, pulled up, different windows. Um, oh, so one thing I do also want to note with with Throne Weapons Champions is it is at eight thirty in the morning. Oh yes, yes. You know, like because the the other the other the other things tend to start a little bit later. You know, when we're talking about our battle, but but that particular one is eight thirty. Um, so is so, it always that early, or is that new for this year? I think so. You know, having having rained at Penzik, uh, I know scheduling everything like you know is really really hard. You try to make enough time to go to every single person who is trying to to you know contribute to to your war overall so i would assume that that's entirely for scheduling reasons to to have presence okay um, so uh so we're talking about the the champs themselves 
uh, Barry, or do you want to talk about the, you know, I don't know, the, the populace, or are you talk which one are you talking oh, this about? This is the Wednesday one, so Ar Archery Championship, right. and the populace is on Friday. Yeah, so this is this is the uh, the walk up shoot. Yeah, so there there's there's I think three three different scenarios, which is the walk up and shoot, uh, the friend or uh, friend or foe uh, shoot, and then the roving, uh, which is uh, like the rest of the range. That's the the advancing soldier shoot. Um, so there are uh, general rules. We've been through these, you know. 30, 30 total champions on team plus 10 alternates. Again, alternates always great to have <laughs> for any number of reasons. Um, we uh, we actually had someone this this past Saturday because we had a a, uh, a competition that that required you know teams to have field at least one archer. They just left their bow in the sun, and the heat from the sun oh. caused the bow to explode. Oh wow! Right? Wow! It, it failed. You know, it swelled and cracked, you know, and then, it, you know, they ruined this, this bow. <laughs> and I really felt for them uh, when they, when they showed the photos and things of it. But like, that was just a thing that can happen. You know, we're at Penzik, you know, uh, every year it's the hottest, coldest, wettest, driest Penzik. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if you, if you have something that is made out of wood or made out of metal that can rust, it will, it will, <laughs> it will get ruined. Um so uh friend or foe is a is a 30 second time shoot uh it's uh plus one for a hit uh minus one for for hits or friends uh you know loose before the marshal calls or loose after the marshal calls um so that's where they literally have like a a shoot within this time frame like you know go stop um if you if you've never seen it or done it before uh the uh the walk up is 120 yards uh, every archer fires two arrows from each of six stations. Uh, each shooting line is roughly 20 yards closer. So that's the thing you're moving up and you fire between. Uh, and then the roving uh, 10 stations consisting of mixed time shoots, precision shoots, and consistency shoots. Uh, exact details are going to be determined by uh, our, uh, by Marshal 1. Archer is Marshal 1. Um, so we'll, we'll wait for some more details as we get to Pensick on that one. Uh, victory condition is majority of the the total points of the three shoots. Okay, nice. And again, just to be clear for anyone who uh, maybe is not involved, uh, that's just like with the throwing weapons. That's not like uh, uh, that's different than like armored throwing and armored combat archery. This is you know people unarmored out there with like really professional bows, you know, firing at targets. You know, in a nutshell. Yeah, these are these are targets with with. You know that you're hitting with with steel tipped weapons usually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, and then we got Thursday. Um, I thought this is interesting, Palinor. Um, the field battles are on Thursday. I think since I got back into fighting at Penzik, 2014, I think field battles have always been either Monday or Friday. And right. Monday was the big whiz bang start off to the war because the field battle is kind of I think objectively one of the best armored battles out there uh it's a good one for fighters it's probably the best one for spectators um and i know the argument is start off with a big uh field battle because you get the most people uh also if you're gonna do a long weekend at Penzik, typically people do the middle weekend so they might be there saturday sunday monday go home on tuesday so they at least get to the field battle and then i've heard the argument for doing the field battle on fridays is to try to encourage people to stick as long as possible don't pack up early and do that battle. What was the decision? Uh, what got this on Thursday this year? Uh, it got on Thursday this year instead of Friday because we're having, uh, and you'll find out here in, in our next battle, the uh, Friday battle is actually a combined battle where uh, Armored is going to fight and then Rapier and then Armored and Rapier or, or in some combination thereof uh, so that actually the, the fighting will get done sooner in the day on Friday so that people can uh, take their, have more time to pack up and, and uh, take their long drives home yeah. if, if, for those that need to. All right. If you combine it, then you don't have to have two separate battles. Yeah, that, right. that makes sense. Right. Um, okay. So, so for the field battles this year, is this uh, is this our typical field battle, uh, or is there any uh, any twist to this one? Uh, it's our typical field battles. Um, we'll be doing five uh, five combats each for armored and rapier, I believe. Uh, 
we'll have some combat archery in the in the first three of armored. Um, I think I saw rapier spears in four and five of the uh, rapier field battles. Um, so, yeah, that, our our tick, basically our typical fields. Okay. And like I said, these are always very exciting. Um, and I especially like watching them. Uh, I don't think he made it out the last Pen Penzik, but Renegade Paladin uh, is his name on YouTube anyway. But usually gets yeah. like a lot of good, a lot of good YouTube videos um, from the castle perspective. Um, so hopefully, if he's not there this year, hopefully someone else will be capturing that. But those are usually some of the most exciting ones. And whenever I, uh, you know, and, and meet a new person who's interested in the armored fighting or, well, usually th this conversation comes up because they see us armored fighting at a practice or something. Um, yeah, we always pull up the, I think it's Penzik 42 Field Battle 4 is the uh, is the go-to marketing battle. Um, I certainly, for my physiotherapist and my chiropractor, I have shown them Renegade Paladin's videos. The field battles, as you say, they're great for spectators. Uh, they're terrific to show your doctors who need to know what the hell it is we're actually doing. Yeah. And they're really just fun and exciting to watch. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Pelinor covered there. So he covered, so the, the armored battle is going to be at 10 a.m., rapier battle at one. And then after that, we have uh, the combat archery and siege battle. Rai, you, you have uh, any knowledge of that one? Those are at three. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm going back and forth here. I'm like, I'm like, Pelinor got the, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like armored rabbit standard, <laughs> whatever. It's fine. It's just like, Hey, now, now explain the one that's the annexation of Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll start with if, if, if this, if you want, um, what, what's interesting about the combat archery and siege battle is that you cannot hit somebody with a sword. You yeah. have to, you have to shoot somebody with a combat archery. Or you have to shoot somebody with a siege, um, or or whatever's out there, and but uh, people can be out there with their shields just to uh, basically be mo mobile pavises uh, or or to uh, uh, to to cover your combat archers, um, and I believe you can take your swords, but you just can't hit anybody with them. Yeah, and you're you're allowed uh, thrown weapons too, I believe. Yeah. So, like, you know, if you if you've got the pork chops and the the uh, the javelins or or any other like manner of like goofy kind of weapon that we use that that really are only good for like, you know, this battle. And then when we have those limited front battles, you know, we we don't get to use them too much in the open fields, but they're fun sometimes for bridges, you know, to like hit someone with like a thrown hammer or something that you have uh, so that you could, you know, be like Super Mario for a second. Uh <laughs> It's it's a good time uh, overall. So if you if you've never done this uh, this particular fight, if you're a heavy weapons fighter, you can still participate and be there to you know help your army uh, on each side uh, to to give them something to shoot at, kind of make it a little bit longer and more interesting for them. Yes, so and our, our our East Kingdom our East Kingdom friend Talon here just a comment. It's a blast for shields. So sometimes the shields love to just run out there and and run defense and grab some throwing weapons and, and throw them back. So. So I have a question. We've got fencing battles. We've got armored combat. We've got a battle for combat uh, combat archery and, and throwing weapons. We have the champions for throwings. We have champion for archery. Do you think we'll ever get equestrian at Pensick? Um, that's going to... There, there's no there's no stables there. Uh, so there's no, uh, no place to keep horses. Um, I think I don't know what the insurance would be like there for that. Um, I it, it's really going to be be uh, dependent on whether the infra infrastructure is built to have horses there. Okay. Whether yeah. that happens or not. I'd say that's probably the number one limiting factor is 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 whether or not there's anywhere to because you know they're they're live animals <laughs> and not particularly small ones. Right. Uh, yeah. so, Fair. So, getting them and and you know i i don't i also don't know how they'll they'll be affected by things like cannon fire and, and whatnot because you know like most of the the animals that we have there the dogs and everything they're usually some degree of service animal uh it, in order for for people to have them there like the horses i don't know how they would particularly feel about that yeah that's a really good point i hadn't considered that one yeah, I know down at Golf Wars, for example, they had like a whole equestrian area that's all set up for that. And it was even kind of like off to the side. 
And even just because of the size of the event, it wasn't, you know, difficult to get to or anything. So, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Penzik has its own uh, its own challenges. Yeah. And yep. it's own weather. It's like it's big enough for, for a little while. It's its own city, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so next we have um, the ANS competition. And uh, I don't know much about that other than I'm assuming it involves ANS. <laughs> and it's and, competition. And it's a comp exactly. It's a competition. <laughs> So it's uh, uh, it's broken up into three sections. You'll have uh, laurels competing against each other, non-laurels competing against each other, and then allies uh, competing uh, in three different sections. Um, they are, I don't remember how many different um, types of entries that they can have. There's uh, made objects, uh, food and beverage, performance, research, um i think that's all of them i might be missing something there uh but the the uh the different champions will will do a, do a project and then bring it and they have to be there to present their project to i believe it's four judges and then uh they will do some scoring uh and depend and assign a number uh that's that's the that's a very simplified version of, of what goes on and then i believe it's the uh the uh, entry from um either of those three the highest entry uh gets the that or wins that section and then i think it's best two out of three will get that point of which there's no points i would really like to encourage everybody to go take a look at the arts and sciences competitions uh, I've only started going to them myself, and I, you know, I went, oh, I'll go take a, a gander. Honestly, the the artisans are incredible and beyond compare. And I was reading the documentation of, of one entry a few years back, and it was like, I did this thing, and the museum said this, but I didn't think that was right. So I wrote to them, yeah, the museum changed their documentation based on what this SCA person had done. So they're not, it's not just like me going, oh, I'll make some garbage and I'll throw it on the table. These things are truly, truly works of art and impressive research, great documentation, beautiful to look at. The artisans who do these things, honestly, they don't get the kudos that they deserve. And I would encourage everybody to go out and take a look, go through and read them. It's amazing what you can learn and what you can, what you can see at the uh, Arts and Sciences competition. And I must add, they do have an alternate section also oh nice yeah yeah so so here we have four heavy fighters four people who've been heavy fighting for quite a long time and this channel is is generally focused on heavy fighting but i think it's it's easy to forget how much as i think all of us were probably enticed into this hobby not specifically for the fighting but kind of for the presentation this sort of medieval world that we kind of are able to immerse ourselves into and that's the ANS side. That's that's the ANS that drives that. I mean, that doesn't mean that heavy fighters aren't doing that, but that's you know, we we want to we don't want to lose sight about how much what we do is centered around you know the historical side of things. Um, so I was always weird though. It was like I remember when I first found out that it was like a war point, a competition. I was like, well, do you get like a bunch of laurels in a room and give them like period daggers and then you know blow the candles out and have them go at it? First of all, that, that wouldn't work, Barry, because we've established that the pen is mightier. Ah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, no, so I, I actually I actually have a grant in uh, in ANS. Uh, I'm I try to be as active as I can. The problem is that these events are usually up against each other. So my my options were always you know actually do do something. But you know, like like you said, I I was very much so immersed in uh, like the the uh, the style. And you know the history of you know the thing that I was wanting to do. Um, so you know, like my my armor is research, my garb is research, my my even even my weapons and the styles that I that I make them in. Like you know, I do a full uh, Sukiito wrap on my handles of my swords in order to to make them as traditional as I can, even though it's made out of wood. Um, but you know, back to this particular competition. You know, I believe that we we actually have. You know, so there's, there's four different categories for this. So, you know, we have our laurels and our non laurels and then our allies, um, you know, alternates respectively. But so, you know, historically, we had only given 
three slots to allies. And then starting last year, um, I had had a discussion with uh, Ethelmark and they had asked for, you know, additional slots for, for allies so we could showcase more known world artisans. Um, and so, you know, we, we bumped it up to, to five so that we would have additional non-principles uh, would be able to show up. So if you, if you have a chance to get down and, and talk to, to people in ANS, you know, who really like love this thing that they do, you know, like, like uh, uh, you had said, like we, you should absolutely go down uh, and check that out. And like most of them, uh, like myself, uh, are not particularly short-winded, but uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, where where does this take place? Uh, I believe. Let's see where. So we had set it up. Uh, we had uh, pavilions like tents on the road last year. Um, I don't sort know. of on the road behind the food court yeah. behind where the barn where we all have court. There's a bunch of pavilions in there. Yeah. And uh, it really, I, I, I shouldn't sound astonished, but you know, I, I looked at, I had no idea what to expect when I first went down and I was overwhelmed. And you know, when one of us, the, the somebody in the SCA, their documentation, their research is so valuable and so skilled that a museum goes, well, heck yeah, you're right. We need to change what we are presenting to the public. You're not, like I say, you're not talking about, you know, me trying to, make some garb or, or or me try to god help us all cook or something like that we are talking quality beautiful amazing things and this is some of the the very finest i've ever seen i just well, and, if, and with this being Penzik 50 actually i i suspect the artisans will be making a, a big point of coming in for some of the very finest at the uh sca 50th there was a big you know the history of the arts and stuff in the in the various kingdoms actually and there was amazing stuff to see there and it was air conditioned so it was a great place to go but the i could just imagine what we'll see this year wait amazing. say that part again it's air conditioned it was at Penzik at, at the sca 50th it was oh, okay. in Indianapolis. It, <laughs> that's one of the reasons i went initially and again glad that i'd gone the embroidery, I learned about the Embroidery Guild from Lockhack. And oh my God, the 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 skill of the embroiderers from Lockhack are amazing. And I was inspired when I saw them. So, so. Well, I'll say if if you're not on that end of Penzik, but you're on the complete opposite end of the Penzik, kind of in the same realm as the ANS competition, we have the world's biggest fizzball competition, uh, deep in the bog. So uh I'm that is sure uh, by that 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 Barry, uh, I would say, uh, is is more of a cultural exchange, uh, it is, <laughs> um, and a a a uh, a traditional sport of the uh, the population of that part of Penzik. Yes, that is. <laughs> a lot of people haven't been to that part of Penzik. That's where we live, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's a very different. I used to camp right above it. Yes, yes, I know. I discovered I discovered that it existed because I was trying to sleep and I heard <sighs> <laughs> I actually still haven't been to it, but yeah, you know I camp there and every year like, you know, it after about an hour you're like, what is going on there? Oh, fizzball is like, oh, that's right, they do the fizzball thing. How have you gone to Penzik for like 30 years and you've never <laughs> you've never walked down the, the street? I, you know what, I made it a point to do it last year, and I think I went to my brother's brother-in-law's house for some air conditioning for uh, for that day. You were you were busy last year. You were busy. You had I, I was yeah very busy last year, very busy. Yep. Um. So let's see. Um. Friday. So uh, we got ten minutes left. So um, well, we can make it easy on Ryu since Pelinor already talked about this ba battle. Ryu could just say what Pelinor said. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Uh, so, so this is like the crescendo of War Fifty. Like this is this is a thing that we we spent a lot of time talking about, um, and and this this you know proposal in general because uh, we were looking for for what I affectionately refer to as a Moab, which is like a mother of all battles. You know, so the the basic idea was to get everyone who is involved in any kind of martial military might into this one 
scenario to to kind of like bring us all together to culminate like celebrating half a century of war um so you know we we we're looking at this it's it's basically going to be a time scenario um in which we're gonna gonna first flip off flip a a coin to determine who's attacking who's defending it's it's you know whichever whichever is attacking and defending they they could kind of make that choice i think east is is heads mid is tails um and uh the the you know scenario will basically be run twice uh with us flipping uh situation flipping how we're going to uh, uh attack or defend respectively um we got a really fun start to this battle uh and i'm i'm really excited for this one because i i love uh, a lot of pomp and i love uh, suspense building um and so we start the battle with siege engines right like the the armored siege engines uh will be uh attacking uh and they they have to hit targets uh, that will effectively break down the wall and that will trigger the beginning of the battle when your attackers get to launch right so rather than there just be like a cannon and you run out you're there as your engines are firing like waiting for them to to hit it for it to break and then you can rush forward um so so that's that's a, a nice suspense building uh exercise uh so it'll either be it'll broken down or after five minutes of elapsed because I don't know how well everyone's shots are. Some people are are incredible, and uh, I would be terrible with a ballista. So, so you, you never know. We, we're some of us are a little rusty. Not everyone came back last year. Um, so, for armored uh, combat archery uh, is hot. You know, it is allowed for this battle. Um, so we we are we're going in with uh, pretty much all of our forces at the ready. Anything you have, uh, you're going to be bringing to bear. Uh, attackers get to start uh, on or behind a starting line. Uh, you could see it kind of indicated on the southern boundary of the field. Uh, and uh, the defenders get to deploy uh, anywhere uh, on the field uh, north of the the first southernmost flag. Um, can you just see where the the southern the the first flag is? right? So you could be anywhere anywhere behind there, right? So you could set up your troops anywhere you want them to be um, as long as they're they're north of that particular mark. Um, obviously, uh, defenders who are hit by siege fire, uh, before the armor advance begins, uh, or five minutes, must resurrect. Um, attackers must capture all the flags uh, from south to north. There is a specific order in which you are going to be capping these. Like you could see them, they're kind of numbered. Um, that's your sequence that you want to go. So the idea is that you're 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 kind of capping these like they're dominoes, right? You know, so like each one of them is going to fold, uh, and then your goal is going to be like, you know, to kind of get them in, in the fastest uh, amount of time. Uh, and once you have the flag, it can't be recaptured by defenders. So even if you pull from somewhere else and you, you recap, like, no, it's, 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 uh, it's taken. Right. So, you know, you, you have to know when you have your resources, how they're going to be allocated. Uh, and then time stops when all of those flags are captured. Right. So you, you have big guns, you have little guns uh, and you have every, every stick you can swing. Uh, brought to bear uh, for capping those flags. Um, and then when that happens, uh, we switch to rapier, <laughs> right? Um, so after after we get a rapier, uh, we have the, the def this is important, the defenders can have rubber band guns. Nowhere nowhere else in Penzig, did, outside of La Rochelle, I believe, do we have anywhere that you could really use rubber band guns. Um, I love rubber band guns. <laughs> Uh, I think that they're fun um, and easily defeated by a breeze, but <laughs> <laughs> so so they're like they're like combat archery, but significantly more useless. Uh, but but they look cool on your belt. Um, so defenders can have rubber band guns. Attackers may not. Uh, attackers start on or behind the starting line uh, in front of the fort, right? Uh, and then uh, defenders may deploy anywhere on the field uh, south of the first northmost flag. Can we get the flag circled? Yep, there it is. Uh, and then uh, the attackers uh, must capture the flag in order, right? So now it's kind of like a reverse format, right? And uh, uh, a flag that has been captured cannot be recaptured by the defenders. Time stops. So what's what's kind of nice about this, right, is that if you fight your way up, right, if you do both, uh, like me, you fight your way up, you drop your gear, and you fight your way back down. <laughs> and then you, 
like so you you have an opportunity to to kind of uh you know like do do the whole thing uh and then i believe we'll have a break uh when we when we switch sides um right and then uh we kind of do it again uh so resurrection for this uh is uh is important uh attackers have unlimited res uh defenders have unlimited resurrection until three flags are taken or 15 minutes elapse um we did this because uh we've tried to do limited resurrections in the past in which we're like hey uh we have three lives and then people will be like is that two is that one life that's mine or plus two do i have three marios like how does it work and then sometimes there's confusion uh for individuals uh who are on a resurrection point they're like can i die if i'm touching the resurrection point so to to alleviate all of that uh we will we will have unlimited resurrections until three flags are taken or 15 minutes have elapsed so there's still a cap of how much time in both cases right right you know, like that because because again we don't want an hour and a half battle with you know a because there's a kill pocket and no one's moving forward. And everybody... Can we call this lessons learned from the last Penzig Moab battle? I'm going to say this is lesson learns from a half a century of doing these. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, I do remember the last Moab battle was uh it was a long one. Uh, it was, it, it was not this, uh, it sounds like you guys have, this actually sounds very close to what they called like the hot gate or something like that. It was uh, a few Penzigs ago, same thing, switch sides, you fall back to different flags and stuff like that. Yeah, so so we 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 took some elements uh, from from there was there was a, a originally a rapier battle that was put forward uh, that had this as like the the baseline for the map and uh, we we're kind of like oh that's really cool <laughs> and the, and the breakdown and how it works like this would actually convert really really well uh, to this this you know grand granddaddy of all battles you know this this mother of all battles um, and so we we've we've Put this together i mean you could see all of the the rules uh you know kind of fully flushed out but you know that's that's a thousand feet up of what it's going to look like um and you know the the army that that claims all of the flags the fastest wins so it's a combined time between your siege people shooting your heavy weapons capping flags and then your rapier people capping flags all right uh, well, we're almost toward the end here, so I just want to run through real quickly what we missed. Um, populist archery shoot on Friday. Um, I'm assuming uh, populist means anybody can do this? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, populist thrown weapons. I guess this would be different than champions. Champions, usually it's like you select a certain number of people. Populist thrown weapons, um, also on Friday. And then we have the service challenge. Uh, so I briefly describe what the service challenge is? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you want to? Uh, <laughs> I thought you said you were going to. Sorry. Uh, let me find that. There it is. Um, so, the service challenge is anytime someone is going to be uh, doing service at specific places, um, that it's easier to log hours, like Marshall's Point, the Watch, Harold's Point, Youth Point, Archery Range, Throne Range, Information Point, Troll, and Lost and Found. Um, and then those those uh, times and, and uh, uh, points will be turned into the, um, where is that turned in? At the end of the day via Google Sheet. So uh, if you help out at, at any one of those mm. points, you will be helping out either one side or the other um, with, the, with the war. So, or, Eleanor, if fighters and fencers help move hay bales, would that count as part of the service uh, points? Is that, that Marshall's point? Is that just Marshall's? That's, that would be Marshall's at Marshall's point where they're inspecting uh, weapons and, and armor and that type of thing. So for all you fighters who are, gonna, like me, going to go out and move even just a couple of hay bales, go to, go to Marshall's point, right, Pell? And yeah. report that you've done some volunteers so they can count your points. Well, yeah. It, it may only be, I think it's only for working at Marshall's Point for this particular thing. Well, maybe the fairies would like to get a point. I'm just tossing that out there. Not this year, obviously, but something to think about next year. Yeah. Setting up the field is certainly something near and dear to all of us. Get the battles going on time. You know, yep. not just us, the fencers, the archers, everybody, the like combat archers, everybody needs the field set up. So, I don't know, maybe next year as a little carrot, 
we can get we can get uh, some points for helping set up the battles. Yeah. Uh, and, is there a correction here that the uh, the populist shoot is actually throughout the week, not just Friday. And so is the service challenge. It's okay. from Sunday through Thursday. Yeah, uh, they're, just, they're all tallied Friday. Is what right. I mean. Okay. Oh, they're tallied on Friday. So, yeah. right. so basically, basically the last things that we determine, like who wins those respective challenges, will, okay. be, will be Friday. And then, so then uh, the way Penzik runs then, so then we take up all of these war points and we add them all together and who wins the war? That, that That's easy. We all win the war. This We year. all win. Yeah. So after, after, you know, 49 of these, uh, you know, the, the Royals uh, decided, uh, honestly, in their wisdom to, to make it be something that we do. This is kind of like an exhibition. Like we could obviously determine who wins each one of these scenarios, but this is all kind of guts and glory. Yeah. Uh, so like we, we can, we can come at it because that, you know, it's it, like anything else, you know, you, you set your own win conditions. You know, some people, your win conditions are just that you show up to battle. Some people, their their win conditions is that they want to fight every single one. Some of them, it's that, you know, they actually, their side wins the battle. Um, this kind of allows you to, to set uh, the fun that you want for yourself um, and focus on, on the good times that you intend to have rather than a score. Uh, yeah. You know, in the future, maybe we'll, we'll get back to old score or maybe we won't actually decide that this is the thing that we wanted. You know, that wasn't just about like how we're going to hyper focus on, you know, who's going to who's going to win what it's going to be more about every single day. We're going to go out and leave it all on the field. Yeah, no, I, I like I like that. They, at least we're trying new things. I think that's how things get better as we always experiment. Um, we try to stick 80 percent of the time. We stick with what's worked. <laughs> I'm sorry. Read the banner at the bottom. <laughs> as I'm saying that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we're about out of time. So I hope uh, I hope that uh, people got out of this what they're hoping for. Uh, I think it's a, a very exciting for the coaches' corner to be able to get the two warlords at the uh, largest, um, you know, uh, SCA event. The largest war. Yes, the largest, <laughs> the largest yeah. war in the known world, uh, and the fiftieth uh, one, fiftieth uh, about anniversary. I don't know if it's anniversary. So as you guys know, Coach's Corner is now Wednesday and every other every other week, except we told you that sometimes we'd be having episodes in between every other week. And next week we have one of those special episodes. And Barry, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, next week we'll be meeting with, I was going to say two other warlords, but Pelinor will actually be here next week. It's going to be yeah. the Warlord of the Mid. Uh, the warlord of Anstiora, and we're gonna have a chat on just basically how do different kingdoms get their, you know, their uh, fighters ready for battle. So, you know, how do they prepare for a big war? So Anstiora, it's going to be Gulf Wars, and Pelinor, it's going to be Penzik. Um, and we hope to do more of these. Uh, Rai, if you're interested in coming on and doing one for the East Kingdom at some point, we can uh, maybe pair up with uh, another kingdom. Um, I think this would be good information just to have because. I, one of the reasons why you want to do this is just because, you know, Ryu and I actually were in the same region in the East Kingdom and we go to the, a lot of the same practices and we're always just trying to uh, improve how we do things. Um, huge props to Ryu for driving that, God, nine years ago now. Um, and we've got a really good practice going. Um, so on that, any other one, any final comments here? I'm good. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. See ya. Have a good night. Cheers.